There are three lessons that we need to learn about love because we're commanded in verse 10 to love. And that's what this whole section of scripture is about. And so three lessons we need to learn about love. The first is this, love is an old commandment. Again, love is an old commandment. Notice verse seven. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Now, I think John very clearly is referring to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. But I believe he's also referring to Leviticus 19, verse 18, which says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So again, he's referring to these words, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I think John referred to these two commandments because Jesus connects these two commands. Turn over to Matthew 22 with me, please. Matthew 22, and notice what Jesus says as he's being asked lots of different questions, but he's being asked a question specifically now by one who wants to know what the greatest commandment is. Now, bear in mind, for them as Jews, this was a subject of a lot of their conversation. There were 613 commands in the Old Testament. And so this man is wanting to catch Jesus. That's the idea. He's being tested as if he says this one's more important than that one. This guy has a ton of commandments to point to. 613 of them. And so the question's asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus responds with wisdom that silences the crowds. Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5. Notice, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes Leviticus 19.18. Don't miss this. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, turn your Bibles with me, please, over to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. While you're turning there, listen to that phrase again that Jesus said. In Matthew 22, he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So within the law and the prophets, within the law, that is the Pentateuch, and the prophets, the rest of the scripture for them, you have 613 commands. All of those hang, the phrase Jesus uses, hangs on these two commandments. Same idea, by the way, of Jesus himself hanging on the cross at Calvary. They speak to two issues. They speak to a vertical relationship that is our relationship with God, and they speak to a horizontal relationship, a relationship with people. Upon these two commands, your vertical and horizontal, a cross, upon these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Now, notice Genesis 22, Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is an interesting chapter because in this chapter, this is the first time that we see the words love, worship, and provide in the Bible. Again, first time. The first time we see the word love, worship, and provide is in Genesis 22. Notice Genesis 22. It says this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now before we go on, know this. This passage bothers people probably more than any other passage in the Bible. It bugs people. But it's interesting to me that he starts with verse one saying this, now it came to pass after these things, God tested Abraham. It's important because this whole thing is a test as if to say to anybody who listens, this is only a test, right? Because we've grown up hearing these words, this is only a test, why? So we don't freak out. So we don't get offended. So we don't go crazy about it. This is only a test. So God tells him, this is a test, okay? And so he's testing him. Notice as it goes on, verse two, then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah 
and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I read verse two, you go, what? This is only a test. It's a test. Remember that. It's a test. Verse three, so Abraham rose early. That phrase is an interesting phrase in Hebrew. What it means is he made haste to make sure that he did not wait even a moment. Meaning he woke up in the morning, boom, he did it. He rose early. He made haste to do it. He rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now imagine if you're Abraham. God has told you to take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him up as a sacrifice. So in other words, kill your son. Can you imagine, I mean, how, how much his heart was breaking for those three days? I mean, how gut-wrenching that was, but he was obedient. He walked in faith. And so he goes. And notice what it says there. <clears throat> he goes, and it says in verse five, Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. That's awesome. He knows what he's going to do in his mind, but he knows that God must do something for this whole thing to work out because he wanted a son. Remember, that was his desire. His great desire was to have a son. In their culture, it would be better for you to have never been born than to go childless. And so he longed for a son. His name was Abram, which means exalted father, and then God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude, right? Also known as father from Utah, right? And so he goes from exalted father to father of a multitude. And he still doesn't have a child. And remember, because he longs for a child, that's his passion. That's, like, that's his, his motivating desire. I mean, his life goal is to have a child. And the same thing is true for his wife, Sarah. And because they're getting older and older and they're waiting decade after decade after decade, they still don't have kids. The Bible says he's as good as dead. He's an old guy. And yet they're waiting and waiting and they're thinking, well, God helps those who help themselves. Nowhere in the Bible. But maybe they were thinking God helps those who help themselves. So his wife, Sarah, says, see, Hagar, she looks fertile. Why don't you go have sex with her and produce a son through her? Abraham just looks over at her. Okay, I'll do it. So he does it. And Hagar gets pregnant and they produce a child. His name is Ishmael. And he becomes a picture of the flesh because he is a picture of what happens when we do things on our own to try to fulfill the promise of God. He's a work of the flesh. It's not something that will bless them. In fact, it's something that causes a problem to them as a people, even to this day. And so he does that, meaning he longs for a child so much, he violates his marriage. He sins against God because he wants this thing so much. Now, I'm sure there's repentance in his heart and eventually God does an incredible miracle and because they are very, very old, 100 years old and 90. And they have Isaac, a miracle child, son of promise. Okay? His name means laughter. Not because she laughed at the promise of God, though she did. The idea is that the promise of God believed upon brings joy. And so this is literally his pride and joy. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and kill him. Now, try to put yourself in his shoes, how he would feel. Try to put yourself in his sandals, okay? He must have been having a really hard time, and yet he says this phrase which demonstrates the faith of this man who's obedient. He says, we will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Meaning this, he knows what he's supposed to do. He thinks what he's going to do. And if he's going to kill his son, then God is going to raise him back to life. 
we'll come back. But I'm going to hurt my son because God told me to do this. Notice verse 6. So Abraham took the word, the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. In Hebrew, you could say it this way. My son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Don't miss this picture. Everything's prepared. He's laid his own son on this altar And he's prepared to kill him. He takes out the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Praise God. Okay. What's the lesson? Why is it there? Well, You know, some will say that the test was pretty clear. Will you love God more than you love your son? The application, will you love God more than you love anything else? Okay, I get that. But that's a pretty pretty radical lesson for that whole section of Scripture to be dedicated. Is that it? Well, God's wanting to test his heart to understand if he has an idol Anything that's in position one is your master passion. And that's a serious thing to God. I mean, God is number one on a list of one. And so he's being tested to see if there's an idol in his life. Okay, that's true. That's a deep truth. But is there more? I believe there's more because in Genesis 22, remember, it's the first time we see the words love, worship, and provide. And that seems to teach me something, and it teaches something to anybody who would have ears to hear. If we want to understand love, we need to understand worship. And God will provide the love. How's that work? Well, here's how it works. God speaks to Abraham and tells him to sacrifice his son to go to the area called Moriah and to the mount that he shows him. He goes and he sees it. It is Mount Moriah. And he goes to offer up his son as a sacrifice on that place, the high place. He would have gone to the highest place. Three days later, he's there. He has the altar set up. He's ready to take his son's life. God stops him and says, no. Why? Because God will provide himself a sacrifice. And Isaac is not that sacrifice. You move forward many years later and David is king. He commits a sin. Judgment comes. There's a plague in Israel. People are dying. David understands he needs to offer a sacrifice to stop the plague. And so he goes to Aruna, who happens to own a threshing floor on the highest place in that area called Mount Moriah. The same place. The highest spot where Abraham would have gone to offer it up Isaac. David buys a threshing floor and offers up a sacrifice there. As he offers up the animal sacrifice, the plague ends. Later, David wants to build a temple for God. God never asked for a temple to be built. He said, I don't dwell in houses made by men. He dwells in us. But yet David wants to bless him and wants to build a temple. God allows all the materials to be assembled, but will not let David build it because he's a man of bloodshed. So David assembles everything for the temple and gives all the materials and the instructions to his son, Solomon. And Solomon, whose name means Prince of Peace, who never was in battle. He had peace his entire reign, builds a temple. And many believe, myself included, that where the Holy of Holies was is built on top of a rock that has been there for thousands of years at the top of what was called Mount Moriah and is now called the Temple Mount in Israel. To make that temple, he'd have to hew a bunch of stones from not that far away. 
And so if you look at that mountain from a helicopter, you'll be able to see it goes north to south like this and it makes a dog leg west. And the space between this piece of the end of the dog leg and the top section of that range is missing. It's missing because that's the area that Solomon pulled stones from to build the Temple Mount. And the stone that's at the end is a weird looking stone that looks like a skull because stones have been pulled away from it. Below it is a dump today, but in the time of Jesus, it was called Golgotha. You see, if you're Baptist, you have in your head that he went up to a hill called Calvary. Yet the Bible never says it was a hill. It was a place. It's a place called Moriah. The same thing spoken of in Genesis 22. And the place that was a high place was the place that Abraham went to offer up his son and God said no. But in that same mountain, the lowest pot, the most humble part of that mountain is a place called Golgotha, the place where God himself did sacrifice his son for you and for me. Yes, that story in Genesis 22 is about the fact that God is testing Abraham, will you love me more than you love your son? Yes, it's about idol worship. Will you love me first? Number one on a list of one. But it's more than that. It's about the definition of love. The love that we have, again, is from God to us. It's a vertical down. And once we have that love, we love him back, now it's vertical up. God loves us more, vertical down. And now we have love for people, horizontal. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. The idea for you and I is this, there must be a place in time where we sacrifice our idea of love for what true love is. True love we see in this, God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that love, if it captures our heart, will radically change the way we treat every person we come in contact with. So love is an old commandment. But listen, love is a new commandment. Notice verse eight. Verse eight. It says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Jesus said the same thing in John 13, verse 34. Notice what it says, John 13, verse 34. Jesus is speaking, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And of course, the world will know that we are his disciples if we have love one for another. So here's the question. We saw that it's an old commandment, and now John is saying, again, a new commandment I write to you about the same commandment. So how can a commandment be both old and new. The idea is this, for many uh, commentators, for many theologians, the idea is that this is a fresh command. And I think there's truth to that. This is a fresh command. But I think part of this is a little more obvious than it might seem. The old commandment is literally what is foretold in the Old Testament. The new commandment is what we see in the New Testament. And it's interesting because David Gusick um, writes a, a wonderful treatment on this issue. He says that Jesus' love is an incarnate love. Because remember, God became man and dwelt among us. He goes on to say his love is wide enough to include every human being, long enough to last through all eternity, and deep enough to reach the most guilty sinner, high enough to take us to heaven. This is a new love, a love the world has never seen before the work of Jesus on the cross. So again, his love is wide enough, long enough, deep enough, and high enough. His love is 4D. It's physically manifested. And the idea is that we're captured by this love in such a way that we would demonstrate this love to other people. Remember, the word says clearly in John 1.1, 1, 1, the word became flesh, Right, the word in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. 
But it says it in such a way, it's declaring it as truth, just like in Genesis 1.1. The heart behind it, we see in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Would you turn there with me, please? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Because there's a tremendous cost and a tremendous blessing because of what Jesus did. I think we, we get that, we understand that at the moment of salvation when it comes to the crucifixion and the resurrection. But we need to understand that this begins in the incarnation. Notice Philippians 2, verse 5. After speaking to the issue of love and sacrifice, telling us not to just think about ourselves, but to think about other people before our own needs, it goes on in Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? A humble mind, a selfless mind, a loving mind who being in the form of God, meaning being God himself manifest, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. The idea is this, what he's saying is, he being God was right to declare himself as God and yet God humbled himself as a bondservant, the lowest slave, and he demonstrated that by becoming like us. He became one of us to demonstrate a love that the world has never seen. The new commandment is that we would embody love. Now listen, the Bible says God is love, meaning this, he is literally love. And in Jesus, we see love incarnate. The idea for you and I is that we don't just love, right? but we become a living example of love. We become love incarnate. So something that people can see, something that people can hear, something they can touch, something they can experience. And that's something that I think I have seen God do in an amazing way, right in front of my eyes since I came to Christ. When I came to Christ, um, God began to do a unique work in my heart. He began to transform me and take a heart that was definitely a heart of stone, like my daughter had prayed earlier. And he gave me a new heart. I started having love for people. But I was very much growing in that love. And in front of me, I saw love demonstrated in a way I'd never seen it before outside of my family. You see, when Vicki and I went forward at the Harvest Crusade, back at the first one, it was Anaheim Stadium, and we went on the field and we prayed to receive Christ. When we repented and we had that experience and we looked up at the sign there at the scoreboard, it said, welcome to the family of God. I liked the fact that I was now a part of something and I believed that I had a sense of belonging, but that's about as far as it went. To me, the word family was family. The family that was family was my family. And that was the deepest love I knew. And now all of a sudden, here's this other love being referred to the family of God, not just storge, but agape love. And now I'm experiencing something that I'd never experienced the very following Sunday when I went to church at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. People I didn't know that I hadn't met before all of a sudden were like family to me and it was the strangest thing I'd ever experienced. It was like love was oozing through the walls of that place. And it was just the way I was greeted, not that I was greeted, it was the way I was greeted. It was the worship, it was the message, it was the fellowship, it was the interaction. It was more than just the look on someone's face or the words they said, it was who they were. And it captured my heart. I was saved and now I loved God, but now I was sensing a connection to people I'd never met before. But the problem was the church was too far away. So we went to a church in our hometown, which was also Calvary Chapel. And I wasn't sure that we'd experience the same thing as I walked into that church. It wasn't like the other church. The other church was big and had a massive building, looked like a church. This one was in a strip mall, didn't look like a church. And as I walked in, there was a guy that was greeting very friendly guy, I thought that's great. And then he went and hugged me. And I thought that was weird. And everybody was just so nice and that seemed like that was fake to me. But it wasn't. It was consistent, it never changed, it just grew. 
And I started realizing, you know what? It's not that they replaced my family, but there were a couple believers in my family at the time. And I wrestled with spending time with my family, which I loved, but also spending time with these people, which was something more than just store gay love, family love. It was more than friendship love. It was something deep that I couldn't explain. It was a love that I'd never experienced before. It was agape love. And as I experienced that love with them and our lives were transformed, both my brothers and me, my sisters, many of them gave their lives to the Lord. My parents gave their lives to the Lord and God began to do a work in my family where now my family was family twice because they were family outside of Christ, but now they're family in Christ. And now there was this amazing transformation that took place in my family. It was unbelievable to see love embodied by everybody that I was around. And as that continued to grow and grow, we saw that there was radical things that took place as the Lord called Vicki and I into the ministry. And we set the ministry before the Lord to say, if this is something God wants us to do, then it's gotta be something that he makes very clear by miraculous means that this is something God wants us to do. So we put ourselves in a position to utterly fail, believing that, that if we put ourselves in a position to utterly fail and yet God's calling us to do it, he's gonna make it happen. And guys, I can, I, can, I can tell you all the details, which are amazing, or just simply tell you, it's amazing what God did. He radically confirmed the ministry again and again and again. We were married, had a house, had a mortgage, had a good job. I quit my job, went back to school, and I worked for the government doing inspections on home loans and made $1,000 a month working one day a week in California, Orange County, California where if you lived below $90,000 back then, you were at poverty level. So $90,000 a year, that was a cutoff. And I made $1,000 a month. And God miraculously provided for us again and again and again, confirming over and over again, this is what I have for you. I'm calling you to the ministry, why? Because what is the ministry? It's love, that's what it is. It's unconditional, self-sacrificial love that gives what is needed. And God had called us to a life like that. And so as we're learning how to do it, if you will, as we're learning how to lead people in it, the body of Christ around my wife and I and our young family showed it to us again and again and again in nothing short of miraculous ways. Finally, I'm getting ready to graduate and as I'm getting ready to graduate from school, I'm going into the ministry immediately after graduation. I'm coming on staff at our local church. And so to celebrate, my wife and I decided to go to Knott's Berry Farm Restaurant. How many of you know what Knott's Berry Farm Restaurant is? Okay. Knott's Berry Farm Restaurant is amazing for its biscuits. The biscuits are unbelievable. I mean, they are amazing. They just melt in your mouth. You could put butter on honey on them, but it would defile it because it's so perfect. It's just beautiful. And so we had our meal, we had our biscuits, we had more biscuits, we talked and had more biscuits. And then we were getting ready to pay for our, our, our meal. We had a little bit extra. First time we had a little bit extra in years. And we're gonna pay for our meal as we treated ourselves with a breakfast out. And the server comes up with a smile on her face and she says, there's no check today. Somebody paid the check and they wanted me to tell you, you don't know who I am but God loves you. We're part of a family. And I have seen God through decades show us again and again how much we are a part of a genuine family. Whether it was something like that or whether it was traveling in missions and going to different places in the world and having an immediate connection with a brother or sister or a group of people we'd never met before because their lives were transformed by the same God. They've experienced the same thing that I've experienced. I've sinned, I've blown it. And yet God intervenes and he has rescued me from my sin, forgave me of my sin, but yet cleansed it from me as well. That's something you don't forget. And when you meet somebody who had that same experience, regardless of the language or the culture, there's a bond, there's a connection that you have. It's a genuine love. This idea of incarnate love is something that God calls us to as Christians so that the world would look at us and be able to say, see how they love each other? 
that the love that we have is something that blows them away because they'll never see anything like it outside of the church when God's people are genuinely loving because there's no love like God's love. God has loved us, that vertical. Now we love him back. He continues to love us. He overwhelms our hearts. And now we're able to love horizontally. That's what God has called us to. Not just an old commandment. It's a new commandment. And it's a commandment, by the way, I saw fulfilled in my life towards those men that I met in the Middle East and then spent time with in Africa this past summer that I did not know. And we become friends and more than friends. We're a family in Christ as we're different pastors from different Calvaries, from different states. And we connect with each other and we text like teenage girls. And it's crazy because I've never had this with other pastors. But we're texting each other every day, sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes after midnight. Just, hey, thinking about you, love your brother, praying for you. Hey, was at a bookstore, saw this book, thought you might like it. Hey, I'm in the bathroom texting you because I'm on a date with my wife and she'd be mad if I knew she knew that I was texting you. That's a wonderful thing to have. Genuine love. Listen, people are starving for it. One thing that we can take away when we look at the popularity of social media, its rise and the fact that it's never going away, whether it's Facebook or whether it's Instagram, whatever type of social media it might be, one truth we can take away is this, people long for connection. They long for relationship because deep inside they long for love and they're not getting it. They're hearing about it, but they're not getting true love. And this is why Jesus came. He came, he died, he rose again, and he demonstrates a love an incarnate love, and then calls us to do the same. He was the light of the world as long as he was in the world, the sun shining light, which brings life because of love on everyone on this planet. And then he calls us to be the light of the world like the moon, shining light in darkness, which brings life because of love. Those three words, light, life, love, are repeated again and again in 1 John after, after chapter two. Light, life, love. They're connected, which means we need to have the right perspective of what love truly is. So love is an old commandment. Love is a new commandment. And lastly, love is in fact a real commandment. Notice what it says here in verse nine. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Listen, we have a tendency of thinking commandments aren't commandments because we kind of refer to some commandments as guidelines, even when it comes to laws that we see, even traffic laws, speed limit. I mean, most people speed. I mean, that's a fact. Most Christians speed, so much so that somebody joked that the last part of the Christian body to be sanctified is the right foot because people like to speed. They just naturally do it. And they'll drive as much as they feel comfortable driving fast. So the speed limit says what it is, but a lot of people will say, well, that's a guideline. A lot of people say, well, if you go four over, not five over, you're okay. And here's the truth, okay? I've been spending a lot of time with law enforcement recently and they told me, Actually, in some places, it is true with some officers and some agencies that five over is okay. In some places, 15 over is okay, meaning they have discretion 15 over. Okay? But you don't know where, you don't know when, and you don't know who will give you that type of grace. And it is grace, meaning you don't deserve it. You deserve the ticket. Okay? The problem is, again, that we see commands as suggestions even when it comes to something like the Great Commission, which is really loving people by sharing truth with them. We see commands as suggestions, so the Great Commission becomes the great suggestion. Not so. It's a command. And so God has commanded us lots of different things, and they are not guidelines. The command to love is a real, genuine, actual, literal commandment, and it happens to be the primary evidence that we're spirit-filled, meaning if we are spirit-filled, love, Peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You say, I know those, the nine fruits of the Spirit. Mm. The fruit of the Spirit, singular, 
is love. And the definition of love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these things come because of love. The primary evidence that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit is love. All these gifts that, that people seek, and we should seek the gifts, but we should earnestly seek the best gifts. And then right after that statement, Paul goes on to give love a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. It's love. It is an old commandment. It is a new commandment. But listen, it is a real commandment. And what that means is that we need to think in a loving way, speak in a loving way, and we need to act in a loving way. But what that means is we have to have light and life to have love, meaning we need truth. Truth exists with love. Love exists with truth. They're connected. And what that means for us as we go out and we do business with the world and we relate to them that we don't get sucked into the world's thinking like the scripture warns us in Romans chapter 12, verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We need to not be conformed to the world's thinking, but to be transformed by the Bible. Meaning the Bible needs to define love for us. And as we live in a world that has hijacked love and even perverted love, and they say love is love in reference to all other manners of love, including, of course, homosexuality. We need to love people enough to speak the truth to them and help them understand that is not love. Love is defined by God. It's not defined by a church. Love is defined by God. It's not defined by an individual. Love is defined by God. It's not defined by this world. And so do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that we understand to love sometimes means that it hurts to love. And sometimes it means the person will say, I'm hurt. And then you can say, I'm sorry you're hurt, but I love you. Because sometimes the only way to help someone is to hurt them. And so we need to grow when it comes to the area of love. Because when the world sees us loving each other and we're transformed, they're going to say, see how they love. But they're going to know we belong to Jesus. And when they ask us questions, we need to have wisdom towards those who are outside to know how to answer those questions in love but always with truth because it isn't loving to fail to give someone the truth. So we need to think in a way that's loving. We need to speak in a way that's loving. And then as the scripture says, let everything you do be done with love. Amen? Would you stand with me?